Hi, I'm Philip Anthony Albertelli, and welcome to The Week in Doubt, episode 23. I'll just jump right in and take care of some quick corrections. On an episode not that long ago, I had been talking about Scientology, uh, nothing new for me on this show, and I had misreported, is that a real word, misreported, that in order to join uh, the Sea Org in Scientology, people had to sign billion-dollar contracts, I, I think I said. in my eyes kind of bugged out when I thought it was a billion dollars. But either I had a brain glitch and misread from the article, or the article I was reading got it wrong. But it's not a billion-dollar contract. It's a billion-year contract. <laughs> Uh, and I don't know what's more ludicrous, a um, billion-dollar contract or a billion-year contract. Uh, at least a billion-year contract is probably pretty easy to cheat. Once you're done with this lifetime, that's probably it. Um, but anyway, so that was one correction. Next is, uh, I think it might have been during the episode entitled The Afterlife, I was talking about my love of the of Egyptian mythology, and I was talking about how most of the Egyptian gods, a good deal of the Egyptian pantheon, have animal attributes. There'll be humanoid beings with uh, animal heads of one type or another, and I talked about the gods Anubis and Set, and I described them both as being canine-headed, and I was partially incorrect. Of course, Anubis is a uh, dog or jackal-headed deity, a, a relatively benign deity who helps guide the uh, dead through the afterlife and attends to the weighing of the scales as Osiris looks on during the weighing of the heart ceremony. The relatively evil god Set isn't exactly canine-headed. In fact, I don't know why this eluded me. One of my favorite pastimes used to be studying uh, mythology, and Egyptian mythology was one of my favorites. But Set has two basic forms. One is he is seen as a human with an animal head, but it's kind of a composite or chimera-like head. It's not one animal, and in fact, it kind of confuses and baffles Egyptologists, because uh, no one can precisely pinpoint what kind of animal head it is that Set has. And uh, on the YouTube version, I'll put up a, a picture for you to see. And Set's head has a long, almost uh, hanging or curved snout, and a set of long ears that are square at the top. Uh, very strange looking. And he's known in a second form that's known as the Typhonic Beast or uh, the set animal. And I think Typhon is sometimes a Greek name that's used for set. And here I'm reading from this Wikipedia article. In art, set is mostly depicted as a fabulous creature referred to by Egypt Egyptologists as the set animal or Typhonic beast. The Typhon has a curved snout, square ears, forked tail, and canine body. Sometimes Set is de depicted as a human with only the head of the Set animal. It does not resemble any known creature, although it could be seen as a composite of an aardvark, a donkey, a jackal, or a fennec. Uh, so that's very bizarre. Uh, so he's at least in part canine. I guess I wasn't totally wrong. Um, but I think in my mind, I kind of always put Anubis and Set together, even though they have different roles and different temperaments, because they both have these kind of animal heads with long snouts. When they say he might partially, the, that Set's head might partially be that of a fennec, they're probably referring to a fennec fox, 
which is a little vulpine animal with large ears. And uh, the reason why I know about the fennec fox is because, as you've probably heard me talk about on the show, I have a pet chihuahua. And there's this kind of fringe idea that the chihuahua might be descended, at least in part, from the fennec fox, which I don't think makes a lot of sense because I'm not even sure that foxes and canines can, uh, that well, that foxes and dogs, that is, uh, can interbreed. They're related, but they're different enough that I don't know if they can procreate. I don't think so. And we know that the Chihuahua genetically is a uh, domestic dog. And for those of you who are familiar with Greek mythology, um, there's a figure in Greek mythology known as Typhon. And uh, I don't know what the if there's any connection at all between uh, Set, the uh, evil Egyptian god, and the Greek Typhon. It might just be the case that early Greek writers or uh, scholars grafted the name of one onto the other. But in Greek mythology, Typhon was the last son of Gaia fathered by Tartarus, and most deadly monster of Greek mythology. He was known as the father of all monsters. His wife, Echidna, was likewise the mother of all monsters. And that's just a quick little summary from Wikipedia. Actually, I think I just found the link between Typhon and Set. According to this, since Herodotus, Typhon has been identified by some scholars with the Egyptian Set. In the Orphic tradition, Typhon leads the Titans when they attack and kill Dionysus, just as Set is responsible for the murder of Osiris. Furthermore, the slaying of Typhon by Zeus bears similarities to the killing of Vitra by Indra. And that's a reference to Hindu religion. I thought Herodotus had something to do with it. Uh, there we go. So I took care of the billionaire contract, and I took care of properly defining the appearance of set. Did I miss any corrections? I think that's it for the corrections. I'm not sure if I'll do any news stories this week. I covered Chick-fil-A uh, on the last episode and the whole uproar that was caused by the statements of Chick-fil-A's president uh, espousing his views uh, about quote-unquote biblical marriage and uh, how he's against gay marriage and how that caused this whole political uh, firestorm and back and forth protesting between gay rights advocates and uh, conservative Christians. There was some kind of kissing by... Um, gay activists at Chick-fil-A, then there was also some kind of, before that, there was some kind of conservative support Chick-fil-A day, something to do with uh, Mike Huckabee, <laughs> where a bunch of Christians went to Chick-fil-A and bought uh, chicken sandwiches. Once again, there's all the Chihuahua going wild. Actually, there was one news story it's actually being covered right now. It's all over TV. As we speak, I'm recording this on August 5th, um, 5.50 p.m. And apparently there was a shooting at a Sikh temple. Uh, it's still being constantly updated, but I'm reading from the Huffington Post. Wisconsin shooting. Several people killed after shots fired at Sikh Temple. A mass shooting took place in the Sikh Temple of Wisconsin, Patch reported. The incident occurred on Sunday morning in Oak Creek. Police say that seven people were killed, including a gunman. Four of the dead were inside the temple, while three were outside. According to police, an officer was shot multiple times by the gunman and is currently in surgery. So obviously that's an awful story, and that's on the heels of that movie theater uh, shooting where 12 people lost their lives because of that crazy gunman. I don't know all the facts about this. I don't know if the shooter was some uh, racist who had something again people against people of Indian descent or against the Sikh religion. Um, or I don't know if it was a troubled uh, 
member of the Sikh community. I don't, out of respect for the dead and injured, I don't want to speculate too much. And uh, not that anyone of any religion should have to suffer something like this, but you know, the Sikhs are a relatively uh, peaceful people and they have a relatively peaceful religion that focuses on meditation, peace, compassion. I, I think it's basically a Punjabi religion, I, I think. Uh, I, I might go back to the 16th century. Uh, don't take that to the bank. Uh, I probably don't know as much about the Sikh religion as I should. I tend to know, as far as Eastern religions go, know more about um, different forms of Buddhism, uh, Hinduism. But, I don't know, once again, some kind of freak gunman. And uh, I don't want to go into a whole tirade about this, because I can understand people. I could go on forever. I can understand people who are distraught, who are depressed, who are mentally or emotionally in a dark place. But I don't understand taking that darkness out on other people. Uh, if you have issues in your life, if you're miserable, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to take this in too far of a dark place because I was going to say, if you, instead of going out and killing innocent people, just off yourself. But that's all I know. It's an awful thing to say. Um, but I don't understand these people. I don't understand the urge that when something's wrong with your life to take a bunch of innocent people with you. But anyway, I think I'll close the door on that before... I, I know it's a podcast that has to do with atheism and a lack of belief uh, but I also like it to be somewhat upbeat in the sense that we rationally discuss um, subjects that interest us uh, by us I either mean the royal we or I mean <laughs> you and I uh, me and you the audience and it, it, even though a lot of people find atheism uh, or religious doubt depressing I, I don't and you probably know if you've been listening to the show I don't think it has to be I think we can skeptically look at different religions and appreciate the interesting um, even uplifting or inspirational things about them while at the same time trying to get to the empirical truth so I don't want to take things um, to a too dark a place by talking about this crazy gunman. So I guess I'll go on to what I was going to talk about. I was going to devote this episode to talking about the Bible and marriage. I was going to talk about the different manifestations that marriage takes within the Bible and maybe even take a couple of jabs at the religious hypocrites out there who maybe haven't read the good book themselves and don't understand how there's all these uh, references to polygamy and other things. Um, but uh, for some reason, I just don't want to get into that. And instead, I think what I want to talk about is a YouTube video I saw today. And... Here I am, I'm moving away from the iPad and going to an old, fat, college-ruled, three-subject notebook. And it was a, a lecture or a talk given by a biblical scholar I've seen on different documentaries and TV shows by the name of Bart D. Ehrman, or Ehrman, Ehrman perhaps, E-H-R-M-A-N, uh, and I like this guy, you can tell he really has a deep respect and love for biblical history and for biblical literature, but he's also a, a really down-to-earth, uh, reason-based guy. And he gave this whole lecture on biblical translation. And at the heart of the talk was basically the point that People talk about the Bible being, if not dictated by God, divinely inspired by God. And he goes into the, the ironic point that how we don't even have the original texts of the New Testament. 
and we're basically working from copies of copies. And he goes into, I made a, I kind of took notes was listen to. It's not something I, I do often, but I found, uh, I almost felt like I was sitting in a classroom in a good way. And uh, I, I found it so inspiring and so full of facts. I didn't want to forget that I just put pencil to paper. And as I already knew, and you might know, the Gospels were originally translated from Greek. Well, not just translated from Greek, they were originally written in Greek in the first century. And as I said, he made the point that we don't have the originals, we're basically reading translations of translations, copies made centuries later. And one thing that blew my mind, he talked about how there are literally thousands of copies of various books of the New Testament out there, each one different than the other, sometimes in little insignificant ways and, and sometimes in big ways that can have an impact on how we view uh, the New Testament, our Christianity as a whole. And he made a good point that it's hard to know what the words of the New Testament mean if we don't know what the words were, if we don't know what the original words were. And another fact I already knew, the Gospel of Mark is the oldest, even though, in order, the uh, Gospel of Matthew is the first to appear of the four when you're actually reading the New Testament. And he talked about how we don't really know where Mark lived. Uh, some scholars say Rome, so he just, for hypothetical purposes, he goes with Rome and how if a member of the community wanted a copy of Mark's gospel, he would have either have had to have done two things. He either would have had to have made a copy himself, or he would have had to have had someone else make a copy for him. And he made the point that 90% of the population at the time, roughly something like 90%, were illiterate. And those who could read and write, and there's no guarantee that they could have done it well. And uh, Ammon goes on to make the point that most likely, just due to human nature, the scribe would have made some errors. And he, he's also a professor, and he talks about how some of his students are a little credulous that you know, why would someone have to make an error? And he challenges them. He says, you know, go home and try to copy the whole gospel of Mark word for word. You most likely got to mess up here and there. And he, he made more specific points later on. He pointed out examples how sometimes the differences between the different copies of the gospel could be just things that don't really change the context or the, the meaning or spirit of the particular book. It could just be uh, spelling errors. <laughs> you tell sometimes you might see a scribe would use the same word close together and like three times out of the three they use the word, the word would be spelled differently. is as if they, I suppose rightly so, they cared more about conveying the message than they did uh, spelling correctly. And he also talked about how there's examples, I believe, in medieval copies where, and this is something we probably all experience, you're scanning the lines of a book or maybe you're copying from a book and you accidentally, your eyes go up to the wrong line and you get a little confused and you end up maybe merging lines or leaving something out uh, because you're misinterpreting your eyes and brain, the uh, order of the sentences or whatever. So he goes on how, I guess it kind of reminds me of how back in the day with VHS machines, you'd make a copy and the copy would be a little lower in quality than the original. Then if you make a copy of the copy, that's, you know, even the quality degrades a bit further and so on. And he talks about how if you have a scribe who makes a copy of the original, they make some grammatical errors or they accidentally leave you know half a sentence or some words out and then the next guy who wants a copy copies the copy and the mistakes get compounded because his errors are now 
added on top of you know the errors of the or original guy who made a copy from the original and this goes on year after year and century after century and then he talks about how let's say you know mark is in rome and someone uh, a believer from ephesus visits rome and they're inspired and they want a copy so they take this co uh, one of the copies with the mistakes in it back to their community and the whole process starts all over again and he went on to talk about how there weren't any complete copies of any of the Gospels till roughly around 200 CE, 200 Common Era, or if you want to use the old terminology, AD, which would be 150 years after Mark originally had written his Gospel. And, and this sounds surprising almost shocking. He talks about how the originals were probably either worn out from use to the point of non-existence, which I guess, you know, we could understand that, or they were discarded, which, you know, sounds outrageous. Even though I'm not a believer, I still have a deep reverence for uh, religious and historical texts. And whenever you hear, especially when you hear about something like the Nag Hammadi uh, Library, the Gnostic Gospels, Try to think of if it was the Nag Hammadi Library or if it was the Dead Sea Scrolls. I think it was the Nag Hammadi Library where someone was, you know, a native person was in Egypt, I think it was, was trying to basically harvest bat guano. I don't know if they're using it for fertilizer or what. They found this cache of old writings and realized they might have been worth something. And I think the guy's mother may have burnt for fuel for the fire. Uh, a certain amount of the uh, Gnostic Gospels. I hope I'm not mixing that story up with the story about the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were uh, the writings of the Essene community and uh, the Essenes in Qumran. Anyways, that the some of the originals may have been discarded in favor of better condition copies. People might have thought, oh, I've got this copy, it's in great condition, why do I need this old raggedy thing? I guess it still perplexes me a little. I mean, another p point that uh, I don't know if he was talking about, yeah, I think he was talking about probably the, you know, the early centuries of Christianity, and it might have been a similar problem in the Middle Ages, where not only did you have people making mistakes uh, while copying, then you might have these scribes who are looking at these different versions, um, that's saying different things that have different words missing or different words added or uh, things put in a different context. And if the person went to try to correct some of these mistakes, they could have been doing more harm than good because now they're introducing a new version of the manuscript. You have the original, which is lost. Then you have the copy, the copy of the copy. Now you have uh, someone's attempt to correct copies, which still aren't the original. There's something else. He um, went on to make the point that this is, isn't just a problem with biblical texts. This was a problem with ancient texts in general. Uh, but since we have more copies of the New Testament, I guess, than any other book, that means more chances for error and uh, more mistakes. This really blew my mind, because like most laymen, we probably know of the King James Bible. And we know that there's probably, uh, we think, a few other different versions of the Bible. But Barty Ehrman, Barty Ehrman, I can't believe the way I pronounce that, but <laughs> D is his middle initial. He states that there are to date over 5,700 copies of the New Testament, either complete or fragmentary. But he, he does specify that these so-called copies could be referring to a scrap the size of a credit card or smaller, some little fragmentary scrap that was yanked from an ancient trash heap in Egypt or something like that. And on top of that 5,700, of those 5,700 copies, there's also copies in other languages, about 10,000 in Latin. Uh, then there's Coptic 
Tex, Georgian, Armenian, Syriac, Slavonic, etc. So there's a whole lot of uh, New Testament <laughs> copies out there. And lots of mistakes, no two copies are exactly the same. And according to him, uh, the oldest copy of any book in the Old Testament is a fragment about the size of a credit card found in Egypt, written, written on front and back. And it must have come from a book because it had writing on both sides as opposed to a scroll, which wouldn't have. And it's known as P-52, P standing for papyrus, the material it was written on, and 52 because it was the 52nd uh, text catalog. And it contains a bit of John chapter 18, where Jesus is conversing with Pilate. And it dates back to the first half of the second century. And as I said, uh, whole copies weren't around to about, this, um, to about 200. But this isn't a whole copy, so this goes back 50 years earlier than that. He went on to the Middle Ages, and he talked about how throughout the Middle Ages, scholars didn't really realize the problem that there were these differences between the different texts. And in 1707, there was a biblical scholar by the name of John Mill, and he wanted to print a Greek New Testament, and he was working with about 100 manuscripts and realized that that he had all these differences. He made something like footnotes at the bottom of the pages to let people know when he found differences. And kind of astonish, astonishingly, he ended up finding 30,000 places or cited 30,000 places where the manuscripts differed from one another. And not all the Christians back in the uh, 18th century were too pleased about that. Uh, but his proponents tried to use reason and say, hey, he didn't create the mistakes, he just found them. And the uh, scholar giving the lecture went on to say that if you consider all the copies out there, possibly up to 400,000 differences between known manuscripts. And I guess he likes to tell his students there are more differences between manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. So that's something to think about. And as I said before, to reiterate, according to Ehrman, uh, most differences are unimportant. Things like bad spelling, word order, uh, accidental mistakes, maybe an inept scribe, things like that. And I think he called it either paraplepsis or paraplepsis. I'd never heard the word before, but it's the scientific term for when you're trying to copy something from a book or reading or whatever, and your eyes accidentally uh, skip to the wrong line, and you end up mistakenly recording something inaccurately. And he gives some examples. I think of at this point he was talking about intentional or what he viewed as possible intentional mistakes. And there's something called Manuscript 109, which was an animal skin or parchment manuscript from the 10th century. No, this, this wasn't an intentional one. This was like a big mix-up, but this was unintentional. The scribal copying Luke, which contains the uh, supposed genealogy of Jesus going all the way back to Adam, instead of copying the genealogy vertically, which was down two columns, he accidentally read or copied sideways, so he got the genealogy all mixed up, and he ended up with someone existing before Adam accidentally, and uh, with God having a, fa a father, a human father. Uh, so a pretty big blunder. Oh, they went on to intentional mistakes, and he talked about how at one point, a scribe, uh, and this might explain why we actually have this today in the King James Bible, a scribe attributed a saying from Exodus to Isaiah, and but later scribes had to correct it. You might recognize the saying that goes something like, you know, they're, they're talking about the, the coming of Jesus as the Messiah, I believe, and they say, as was written in the prophets. And they say that to kind of generically cover the different prophets instead of continuing to use the possibly intentional mistake of as was written in Isaiah, when what they 
claimed to be written in Isaiah was actually from the book of Exodus. And then in Luke chapter 2, he talks about the story that we're probably all familiar with. It's the, one, the only time in the gospel where you have those missing years kind of, well, maybe not the missing years because he's 12. I think the missing years might start at 13. But when you really hear about Jesus' um, childhood or later childhood, Jesus is 12 years old. Uh, the family goes to Jerusalem for a festival or a celebration. Maybe it's Passover. And um, all of a sudden they realize they forgot Jesus on the way home. So they have to go back. They find Jesus... Uh, conversing uh, with the the learned uh, rabbis or whatever uh, in the temple or in the synagogue and originally Mary says your father and I were looking all over for you but scribes were kind of disturbed well God's Jesus' father uh, at best Joseph is kind of the adopted or assumed father you know um, so they th want to emphasize the divinity of Jesus so they would say they they would intentionally change it from your father and I to Joseph and I were looking for you or we were looking for you so there's what appears to be an intentional alteration of biblical text for those people who like to talk about the bible being the direct word of god or whatnot and then uh we're probably all familiar to some degree with Matthew 24, and it talks about the end of time and uh, that famous saying you hear about no one knows the day or the hour uh, that, you know, the end of the world supposedly or the end of time will come. Not even the Son, only the Father knows. And some scribes didn't like that, so they excised the portion about not even the Son knowing. So Jesus seemed like uh, a little more knowledgeable, I guess. Then one thing that really blew my mind was one of the most famous stories, supposedly, that we find in the Bible and we see uh, in movies about the life of Jesus, and I've even gotten the chills, you know, watching this, is when the men are going to, or the crowd are going to stone the adulteress, and Jesus saves her and says, you know, let him who be without sin cast the first stone. Well, supposedly, uh, this that story that we find in John isn't in the earliest versions of John. Someone supposedly tacked it on later. And he says it might have been the thing where someone found the story elsewhere, put it in the margin of one of the copies of John, and some a later scribe thought maybe it was supposed to belong as part of the book and added it into the actual text instead of leaving it in a margin. And then there's uh, one of the key differences I, I often talk about when I talk about the differences between the Bible. At the end of Mark, there's kind of a grim ending where we have nothing but an empty tomb. And uh, the women are directed to tell the apostles or disciples to meet with Jesus in Galilee. But they're so spooked, they don't. They just take off. So you're left with... Um, the possibility that the apostles didn't get the message was that was meant for them. They didn't end up meeting up with Jesus. And all we have is an empty tomb. And it ends with the words, something like, they were afraid, or something like that. And scribes didn't like that. And so they ended up tacking on some extra verses, which I think we'll still find in the Bible today, possibly in double brackets, to say, hey, this wasn't originally here. With this kind of a happier ending um, you know, everyone meets up with, with Jesus and he talks to, them, talks to them about how they'll be able to speak in tongues they didn't know. They'll be able to handle serpents without being harmed. And the guy was joking. I believe he, he lives in the South, I think, or teaches in the South. And he talks about how, how he wonders if all of those snake handlers know that the portion where, the portion that they're, basically whole religion is based on a, you know that core of their specific brand of Christianity, the handling of snakes and glossolalia speaking in tongues, if they know that wasn't an original part of the uh, Gospel of John, or rather uh, the Gospel of Mark. And then there's stuff where Jesus in Mark chapter 1 heals a leper, and some versions have it, Jesus lays his hand on the leper because he's moved by compassion, and in 
others, probably the earlier version, which people didn't like, so they changed it. He's angry and reaches out and heals the leper. Maybe he's angry with an, with an oppressive spirit that's within the leper or something like that. I don't know. That's speculation. I think he talks about the differences between Mark and Luke, how in Mark the crucifixion is definitely a very grim affair, a whole lot of pathos and suffering. Uh, Jesus says nothing will be led to his crucifixion, silent on the cross. He's mocked even by the robbers on, uh, flanking him, also crucified. And the word, when he does eventually speak, it's those famous words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he dies. Whereas in Luke, Jesus is more in control, more aware of his role as, you know, I suppose the Messiah, son of God. And he consoles women who are weeping while he's on his way to the cross and even has the presence of mind to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do when he's on the cross. And uh, he talks about, he gets into the realm of anti-Semitism, how the whole Father, forgive them thing, which I guess was interpreted by some as asking Jesus to forgive the Jewish, perhaps uh, Pharisees or whoever it was that uh, handed Jesus over to Pilate or handed Jesus over to the Pharisees. And some later scribes, and I believe in the Middle Ages, would excise that prayer to forgive them out of some kind of anti-Semitic motivation. And then he talks about how in some later manuscripts, um, sometimes it's more of a misogynistic t tone, uh, it was things like the phrase uh, women uh, be silent or something like that that you don't necessarily find in earlier ones earlier versions and uh, he, this guy's definitely not a big fan of Dan Brown uh, I think he, he thinks Dan Brown has his theology and biblical history ass backwards doesn't know his facts and uh, he might may even have written a book addressing the problems with Dan Brown's uh, "Quote unquote religious history," you know that you find in the Da Vinci Code and whatnot. Uh, even though Da Vinci Code was be a work of fiction, you know, it's supposedly it's based on um, religious fact or whatever. Uh, and he talks about the, and I think this is a common misunderstanding about the Council of Nicaea, which was this, which I've talked about before. Uh, you had Constantine, the quote unquote first Christian emperor, and and he calls for this Council of Nicaea. And a lot of people think this is where uh, it was decided which books will go in the Bible, which ones will get cut out. And I think even that's one of the mistakes he thinks. That's one of the mistakes he, he says that Dan Brown makes uh, when he talks about the Council of Nicaea and the Da Vinci Code. But really, and you might remember me talking about this before, especially in the Easter edition, what was settled on or discussed during the Council of Nicaea was they, they settled on a date for Easter um, and they came to a conclusion about the uh, nature of the Trinity um, to some degree you could say the nature of the divinity of Christ but I think there is some connection between Constantine and uh, the organizing of the canon yeah it was um Constantine uh, commissioned 50 Bibles in the Greek language, and this was in 331, uh, and they are prepared by Eusebius of Caesarea and made for use uh, for the, the Bishop of Constantinople. And as I think one of my favorite theologians, biblical scholars, Dominic Crossan, would say, you know, um, even though uh, it might not have necessarily been the job to decide which books were in and out, uh, Eusebius probably would have felt the pressure when, when the Roman emperor asks you to give him some Bibles, you're going to give him some Bibles and you're going to have to make some decisions about what's going to be in and what's going to be out. But then later on, centuries and centuries later, there was the uh, Council of Trent, I believe it was, when further decisions were made about uh, what's in and what's out. But I can't believe it's been over 40 minutes, so I'm going to call it quits and I, I think I really enjoyed this episode of the podcast or I enjoyed talking about biblical scripture and the history of the early church 
I love all that stuff. Um, the thing about the guy in the Sikh temple was a downer, but uh, I love religious documentaries. I love learning from them. I love reading about this stuff. So being able to talk about what I learned and what I remembered while watching Professor Ehrman speak today, that was definitely cool. Uh, as usual, thanks for listening. If you enjoy the show, like us on YouTube, subscribe on YouTube, help me create a bigger quote unquote impression of the show. You know, kind of increase the ratings. Um, it'll make it easier to find for people. Hopefully, that will increase the podcast popularity. As always, it'd be great if you could like or review us on uh, us as Royal We again on iTunes or on Podbean. But I'll stop nagging you for now, and this has been the Weekend Out. Thanks.